We've just been introduced. I'm Anish. This is my colleague, Jackson Brown, who is a senior researcher at the Allen Institute for Cell Science. And we're here to talk to you about lessons learned during a technology partnership over the past six months, where we have distributed, this, tackled the problem of distributing terabytes of open images and doing it in a way that it's accessible to any Jupyter notebook anywhere in the world, and that given the same data and the same code, that notebook will run the same time everywhere. So you know this, you love this, but it should come with a warning sticker, and that's notebooks tend to be fragile. They break over time. So when you share a notebook, oops, I forgot, I have a one gigabyte CSV file on my machine that I didn't put in GitHub, because it doesn't fit on GitHub. Notebooks break over time. Whoops, somebody deleted this file on the network attack storage drive, and now I don't know how to run this notebook, and they tend to break across machines. Oh, you're on Windows, you need a different deserializer than we used on Unix. The reason that this is happening is because as a community right now, we're only standing on one of the two pillars that make notebooks tick. And we've done a lot to really make code versioned and immutable, and there's more that we can do on the data side of the equation. And what I would encourage everybody in this room to start doing is to think about your notebooks as pure functions of data and code. And the importance of a pure function is that if the inputs or the parameters to that function do not change, the output will never change. So a pure function is a function that depends wholly and solely on its parameters. And we'll look at this more in detail in just a moment. As I mentioned earlier, up until now, code has gotten most of the attention. You can version pin to a particular module on PyPI. You can git check out a particular state of the repository. You can docker run a particular container. But on the data side of things, it's still a little bit like the Wild West. And one of our colleagues, Pete Warden from Google said, this feels like it's so bad, the state of man data management is so bad, it feels like we're coding without source control. And so the question now is, what can we do to bring code style management to data? All of you are familiar with Docker, with PIP, with GitHub, and if we can use these metaphors to manage data, we get some interesting results, and that's really what we're gonna share with you. Everything that we're gonna show you today is open source. You can see our GitHub link at the top there. At a very high level, we think about Quilt as Docker for data, and the question we're answering is, what happens when you bring code style management metaphors, like namespaces, like versions, like tags, like copy on write, what happens when you bring those metaphors over to data? So at a very high level, the data packages that we're gonna talk about today have a very simple life cycle. Packages are built, you then push them to a registry, you pull them from a registry, and then in order to consume or deserialize those packages, you install them. So in one line of code, this is the change that we wanna see in the world. Every notebook that you write starts with import pandas as PD, import numpy as NP, or that at least that's really common. And we wanna add this ability for people to import their data dependencies and just start working. So when we talk about data in the context of this talk, the data management system that Quilt is built on top of is completely schemaless, which means it can take any type of data of any size. So you can put structured data in it, unstructured data like images, semi-structured data like JSON, it will all work, and it scales from sizes of zero kilobytes all the way up to about two terabytes. So format and size agnostic. Let me turn it over to Jackson for a moment. So uh, if anyone has ever worked in any scientific lab, I'm sure this image somewhat looks familiar to you. This is kind of what scientists are used to, right? This is just, you start at your lab and, and they say, and you say, where can I find the data? And they point you to a web page and they say, just download it, just, just go ahead and download all the files. But you don't know what's in these, you don't know what the size they are, you don't know how to deserialize it, like, you know, if they're tars, they're zips, what's in these? I have no idea. And this is bad for numerous reasons, but, but, the, but the core one that, you know, I care about is, really what is in that data. So for us, like what we're trying to move towards is saying, here, just give me the data and, and we can view it on a catalog and we'll go into this catalog later, but, but the nice thing about Quilt is that it will pre-process and, and populate that metadata for us. So it'll tell us, you know, has it been installed before, who's been installing it, uh, what size is it, what files are in there, and also how can I deserialize it, how can I use it. When I first started Allen's suit, uh, I, you know, I'm, I got in charge of trying to figure out methods to actually distribute both internally and externally our data. And the, pretty much the first day someone came up to me and said, you know, you have scientists that want to share 
nearly everything that comes to their computer, and they don't know how to do that, that's, that's your job now. And I'm sure many of you have also been in that situation where someone just says, that's, that's your job. You, you know, you have to, you're the one that needs to get our data out there in a nice, usable way. The other problem that they come to me often with is, where the heck are my files and did anyone mess with them? Right? Like, this is a big problem for us in specifically the way that some of our file formats, some of our I imaging formats, if a person even opens that file, the metadata changes. So that's, in our sense, a new file. Uh, and versioning that properly is a little bit difficult with standard systems. So, so why do we care about uh, distributing our data in the first place? Well, um, as you can see in the background, it's, it's, it's very complex, it's very well tagged. Uh, this is actually a 4D image, so it's the standard three dimensions and then also time. Um, and it's highly labeled, tagged. This is hours and hours of gene editors, microscopists, uh, modelers, and visual, visualization experts going through and working together to make this data at a high quality. Uh, so we want to share it. It's highly useful. Also, we want to share it because it's, we have a ton of it. Uh, that, that single cell, I'm going to go back, this single cell, we have probably about 250,000 uh, samples of a cell like this. Um, so we have 30 terabytes right now, and it's constantly growing. We just have a lot of high quality data. So we need to find a system that will help us share this in an intuitive and understandable way. I'm going to pass it back to you. Okay, so we're going to organize this talk around code samples that you can bring back to the labs and teams that you're working on and hopefully get immediate value out of. And let's just get right started with that. So really simple problem. I've got data. I've produced a result on my machine, and I want to share it with other people. So this is the workflow that we have been using. Uh, the very first line there is super simple. I just have a NumPy array. This happens to be random data. Imagine this is actual structured data. And then I'm going to do two things. I'm going to build that data image locally. And you'll notice that this URL or this namespace is constructed from the package owner, the package name, and then a subfolder inside of that package. And all I'm doing is I'm assigning the value of this NumPy array to that namespace or that path in the package. And when I push it, it now is available to us on a remote registry. And let me show you at a very high level what that looks like. I'll blow this up. So the package is private by default. And you can start to see a little bit of, meta of metadata. I'm going to jump to a more mature package. This is from AICS, or the Allen Institute for Cell Science. And the important thing here is that if you create a metadata system which forces the users to input the metadata, they're just not going to use it. So all of this is implicit data profiling that's done by the system. And you'll see here, we'll show you package, excuse me, traffic to the packages. So how many people are installing it? How many people are viewing it? You can see the latest revision. This is the package top hash, which uniquely identifies that particular version of a given package. And these top hashes are immutable, which means once you have a given top hash for a package, it can never change. And then you'll see a little bit of metadata on the size of the package and what types of files it contains, and then an automatically generated directory structure of the package, which is here under contents. All right, so that was me pushing the data to a remote registry, and what does the consumption experience look like? Somebody who, a colleague of mine, let's say, who wants to grab this ND array that I've just created, they would do an install. Oops, let's go back. They would do an install, they would import the data, and boom, out comes the data. So notice there at the very top, I declare my data dependency on this package, and then I type ex.d1 with parentheses. So notice, normally when you deserialize a NumPy array, you have to do numpy.read, and sometimes it's even more convoluted than that. But we have a dispatch table inside of Quilt which knows the object type and then introspectively finds the right deserializer for that data type. So the key point is you don't spend a lot of time looking for files and transporting data dependencies. You just import them into your notebook and start working. Data slicing. As I said before, uh, we have about 30 terabytes. Um, we are still processing a lot of that, but on Quilt servers, we have uh, three terabytes right now. And so we need to talk about, you know, not many people have the space just readily available to, to download all three terabytes at a single time. So how, do we, how can we subset larger data sets into smaller data sets that people can use in their own work? So the first example that I'm going to show is just uh, Allen Institute for Cell Science, we produce a random sample every time we generate new, uh, larger versions of our packages. That pretty much is exactly as it says, it takes a random sample of all the data. Um, and of that, we have a subsection called cell segmentations, or the actual namespace is called cell segs. 
Uh, and we can install that specific sub-package. Sub so if someone is truly only cares about the cell segmentations, that is a very easy install command to do. It's just look at the namespace and then tag on an additional subfolder path to it, and you get only that portion of the data. And just like Anish just showed, it's the same way of using that data as before. You just say import random sample and then go to the namespace cell segs, and there's all your data for you. And this is like a text. You know, this is a text-based file, file, uh, file navigation system at this point. The other very important aspect uh, for us uh, in a scientific sense is publishing papers, right? So again, if you ever worked in a lab, you want people to be able to reproduce your work. So we, you know, as we develop our data sets and as we add more to them and maybe we make a training set and we say, we need more negative, we need more negative uh, training examples, we know positive training examples, uh, that data set is going to change, but the namespace should really be the same. So when we publish a paper, it would be ideal to just say, okay, here's you know, your lab and here's your paper as the, as the project namespace, but then when you publish paper, you say, here, this is the hash to reproduce this work, and it will install those specific files that were used to create and train and actually test that model or that, that result that you got from your paper. All right, so I'm going to go through an example of ad hoc slicing here. And how many people are familiar with the Google Open Images data set? Okay, so Open Images is about 9 million different images from the open internet that are all tagged and annotated. And it's a crying shame that nobody uses this data set. And I think part of the reason is that it's just so large enough as to be intractable. So I mentioned 9 million images. It's about 18 terabytes in size. It doesn't even live in a single location in Google Cloud. So the problem we'd like to show you how we've solved today is, let's say I want just a handful of images with a specific tag. Those of you who follow Silicon Valley are familiar with the hot dog, not hot dog problem. So let's say that we want to grab images that are tagged with a certain type of food. So I'm going to actually grab images that are tagged pretzels, OK? And the key point here, this is a standard SQL query. But this SQL query is actually issued to a file. There's no standing database, so we use Presto's DB, PrestoDB from Facebook to actually query files and treat files as tables. And it's a very, very cost-effective way of being able to slice large data sets that aren't practical for people to materialize on their machines. So key point in this query here is that I'm addressing a particular file, and I'm going to ask for a specific keyword in the description, that is contains pretzel, and you'll see that when I execute that query, what I get back is a pandas data frame. And if I scroll through this data frame, I'll see different types of annotations. So for each image, I have an image ID, I have a bounding box for where a particular label is in an image, and then I have an actual pointer to where that image lives on the web. All right, so this is just the positive training examples. I now want to be able to slice out the negative training examples. So I mentioned earlier that there were 9 million images in Google Open Images. Do you think we have more or less non-pretzels? They're way more non-pretzels, right? So the key thing we're going to do here is not only are we going to invert the logic of our query, but we're going to ask for a random sample. There are SQL gurus out there. There are much faster ways to do this, but it's a small enough subset that you don't feel it when you run the query. And we're going to limit it to the number of positive training examples that we had. So what we're now able to do is we're able to create a training set with an equal number of positive and negative training examples. And you'll see that everything I've gotten back here in this data frame is it contains a description which is not pretzel. It's exactly what I want for teaching my classifier this concept of pretzel versus not pretzel. All right, let's look at some examples of deserialization. So earlier, Jackson showed an example of browsing a quilt package, and it looked like a text-based interface to a file system. Sometimes, however, we have multimedia, and we want to be able to browse through that in a visual way. And so I'm going to use the Berkeley segmentation data set, which is a benchmark data set of 300 different images. And the first thing you'll know there is that when I did the install, I got a no-op. And that no-op is to my advantage because Quilt deduplicates all of the fragments that are trafficked, which means that if you have already the dependencies that you need on your machine, there's no network activity and there's no disk activity. Quilt's like, oh, he already has the hashes for these data fragments. He's got what, he's need, what he needs to start. So, what I'm going to do here on the deserialization side of things is the Berkeley segmentation data set, as I mentioned, is 300 images. It isn't useful to see a bunch of names like N103070. And so inside the package namespace, which is just bsd.images.test, right? I've imported the packages, the packages bsd. I'm going to give it a custom deserializer. 
And in this case, we provide a library of convenience deserializers so that in this case, for images, you literally have to do no work. And you're like, okay, I wanna see this path of the package as a plot, and boom, there it is, visually browsable. Let's take another example here. Any, any PyTorch fans in the audience? Cool, we're big fans of PyTorch and heavy users of PyTorch. And as you know, different machine learning kits, toolkits like TensorFlow and PyTorch, they have different data formats, what a pain. So the question is now, how do you go from a quilt package to a machine learning friendly data format? And the answer is, we're gonna use the as a deserializer mechanism again. And we provide CAN deserializers for popular packages like PyTorch. And all I'm doing here is I'm browsing into my package namespace, that should say BSD, if it's an error there. I'm browsing into my package namespace and I'm going to hand it a data set deserializer, which will then present that as a PyTorch data set, which is an abstraction that PyTorch can work with. And now I have the data living in Quilt, but I'm able to interact with it in a machine learning toolkit in a native way. Uh, this is uh, very important for imaging scientists, uh, specifically because imaging formats are insane in a certain sense. Uh, we work, uh, at Allen Institute, we work with probably 40 or so different imaging formats, and providing a deserializer for all those is relatively hard to do, uh, but with this functionality we can say, okay, you know, if you want to access our data and view it in the same way we do internally, this as a capability is incredibly powerful for us. And so, you know, building a custom deserializer means that we, we can allow people to focus on using our data and not worry with ingesting our data. Uh, you know, that is a part of the problem with just sharing, you, you can share all the data you want, but if people can't actually view it or can't actually use it, that's not usable data, that's not open science. Um, and the last example we wanna talk about is rehydrating models, or, you know, you've already trained your model, I want other people to use it without actually having to, you know, retrain it in, in whole. Um, this is pretty important. Uh, from a very high level, uh, I work on the modeling team at Allen Institute, and so, uh, that is producing predictive models. And this most recent model that we made is, is called the label-free method. It is, uh, without going too much into cell, cell biology, uh, we, we take this bright field image on the left, which is exactly, if you go back to your high school biology class, this is, the bright field image is basically what you see when you look through a microscope, right? So it's, it's like the bare bones, just let me see the cells on this, on this glass plate. Um, but with a little bit of gene editing and, and, and tagging of proteins, you can, you can produce all these channels in the middle. So at the top one, I think that is uh, lamin B1 or fibrillarin, which is, which is a protein in the cell. And you can see the nucleus is the, is the dark blue there uh, and, and some more structures that I don't want to go into. But you can tag all them with uh, all, the, all the proteins with fluorescent light or with, with a fluorescent tag that you can image. And because of that, we can take a, an, an untagged bright field image and a tagged structure and we can match them up and produce a predictive model. But this takes a ton of time and a ton of resources. As I just went over, it takes a gene editor, it takes a microscopy team, it takes a modeling team. Not many labs have all those resources readily available. So it'd be nice that if we produce this model to be able to instantly share that with other people. Right? It would be really, really cool to say to a high school student, oh, it's really neat that you have that bright field image. Maybe you want to get an image of the nucleus. And because of, because of that, we actually can do that. So we've produced a, label -free, a quilt label-free package. So to actually get our pre-trained models, people can just install them and use them normally. Uh, right now we have DNA, fibrillarin, lamin B1, the membrane, et cetera. Uh, and to actually use them, you know, you just say, import our FNET package, uh, load the model uh, that you just installed, and then you know, process your, your input image, but then to get a prediction, you don't have to do any training. It's already there, it's already installed uh, without any hassle from you. So to wrap up, why is it important that we get our data out there? Well, we may have an internal institute workflow where it takes a long time for us to you know, prep and gene edit and tag and, and label everything that we produce, but let's package up all those outputs and send them out to a world that in, in a decent way, in a good way, that it actually demonstrates open science, right? If, if people can't use the data that, that you're delivering in the way that they want to, is it really reproducible science? Is it really open science? And for us, Quilt covers the four bases we need to actually demonstrate open science, in my opinion, which is we have prototype data or R&D data where you know, it, might, it might just be a one-off experiment, might just be one-off research. But we also have production data, and, and both those need to be covered internally and externally. And the same system can cover all four of those bases for us, um, which, which means that any notebooks that we produce or any research that we write, the 
the tagline at the top which says import this data set, that same data set can be imported externally as well as internally. Great, uh, so we're gonna end with a few recommendations. So the first is, let's stop the insanity, right? Uh, as Pete Warden mentioned, you would never code without source control. And to me, it is literally insane that we aren't versioning and storing our data in immutable blocks. So really simple place to start, version your data and your models. We can talk about different solutions and methods for doing that. We've shown you a few during the course of the talk. And it's a really obvious point, but it's still too hard to do open science. And so what we're really trying to contribute is a fundamental piece of data engineering that gets solved over and over 100 times all around the world badly. And we wanna solve those set of data engineering problems once and give them to community as a set of reusable building blocks. And that's what makes for simple, you build complex pipelines from pieces that you understand well. So from a design standpoint, we've talked a lot about immutability. Here again, the key point is that once a data set or a package is mint minted, it will never change. This, you incur a cost for this, and that means every time you edit that data set, you copy on write that data set. But the key point here is with an immutable history, you can not only audit what you've done, but you have 100% guarantee that your code is executing against the same data substrate. The architecture is fully distributed. What does that mean? It means that when you are streaming data to Quilt or from Quilt, Quilt is talking directly to blob storage. It's talking directly to S3. So there is no server-side bottleneck. The client simply gets a signed URL, and that URL then allows the client to communicate directly with S3. And this is critical because you may have peak usage times where there are hundreds of thousands of people pulling data from your servers. You don't want that to be that load to be on your servers. You want it to be on Amazon or Azure or whichever cloud provider you use. Or even on a local NAS, you can run Quilt against local storage as well. Deduplication, I feel like we talked about fairly well. This is the beauty of Merkle trees and hash trees is that you know a given fragment by its content addressable identification, which is just a hash. And therefore, you know two people could call two different pieces of data, two identical pieces of data, different things, but the system will understand these are the same bytes. All right, so quickly on the architecture, as I mentioned, all of this is open source. We would love to have you as contributors. I'm really showing the slide to give you a sense of where we could use help. So the compiler that we saw earlier is implemented in Python. We use pandas and PyArrow to do the parsing and serialization. The registry is largely built around Flask, and there's a Postgres database instance underneath. All of this is containerized, I should mention. The registry's key job is to manage indexing of the data and permission management for fragments that are in the Quilt store. The catalog, which you saw earlier, does searching and browsing, and that's in everybody's favorite, React and Redux. All right, so I think we've talked about a lot. We're gonna have plenty of time for questions. Uh, if you would like to follow up further, we'll make these notebooks public. And there also is an article written by Jackson on data notebook exploration using Quilt and the Quilt data pipeline. So if you're looking for more technical details, you can find this on the Allen Cell site. You can also hit up the Jupyter blog and look for reproducible data and you'll find this post, which explains in detail how Quilt works and how you can apply it to your daily workflow. And that is everything we wanted to talk about. I'd love to spend some time hearing what your problems are with data flows and, and how we might help. We think about that every day, and there are three solutions we have come up with. Uh, they aren't ideal, but they work. And so one of them, your cloud providers have a mode called requester pays. And this essentially means that the requester, if they have an identity provider that's linked to that cloud provider, they then pay for the egress from that bucket. That's one way. It isn't beautiful, but it's kind of a directed, brutal solution. Uh, the second thing that you can do is Amazon will actually allow you to designate an S3 bucket as open data. And if they stamp your bucket or approve your bucket, egress from that bucket is now free. The fourth way is really server-side slicing. And so the, the real reason that we need PrestoDB and we need the host version of that is called Amazon Athena is to reduce the amount of egress. 
And a very, very typical pattern in data science is that, yeah, I need to sift through an enormous data set, but actually in practice, as we saw in the machine learning example, I only need 1,000 rows or 100 rows. So the cost of running PressoDB is much, much, much lower in terms of compute than you will pay for people egressing enormous chunks of data. So those are the three solutions. Did, did I miss anything? I mean, also, and in a more specific example to Quilt is that the Allen Institute doesn't pay for any, it's, it's, it's free, any public package is free for external people to download. So for us, there's no upfront cost, which is wonderful for us. <laughs> I forgot method four, which is put it on Quilt. So our business model actually covers egress from public buckets, right? And the idea there is if you're giving your data away, you're making the world a better place, we'll foot the cost. Other questions? Question? Yeah. So uh, in your, uh, your storage example, you had a Pandas data frame that you put <coughs> into Quilt, and you pull it down and it can It is. So the question is about accessing quote packages from other languages. So eventually, we will have first class clients for those packages. However, you can use them today. And there is a function called quilt export, which will take the package out of Python native formats and just dump it into a bunch of files on disk. It isn't ideal because you lose some of the deduplication, but a C it's crazy. And it's not an open format, but CSVs are actually super cross-platform. And it's one of the silly problems that we ran into. We have all these fancy deserializers, like we use Pyro to dump tabular data into Parquet. And it turns out that CSV, although Parquet is much more performant, CSV is more cross-platform. So the short answer to your question is yes, you can export the package as files. The second thing which the system will do for you, so I'll just back up to the actual deserialization example, is you can also get a path to that data on disk. So I have to go back very far. Don't, okay. So, ex.dl, if you, with other types of data, if we don't have a deserializer for it, we'll just tell you here's where it lives on disk. So it's just a path at that point. You have to look in the metadata and see what the file types are, but you can do whatever you want with that because it's just bytes on disk. It does not today, it could. So there's a profiling pass. During the build step, the data are profiled. You can just, you could extend the build to profile HDF5 and other file formats. And as an example of the kind of agility that abstraction buys you, the first version of Quilt was not built using Parquet for tabular data. We used HDF5. We had a lot of problems with HDF5 though, so we moved to a different format. Come on up, I feel like you should answer some of these questions. Uh, just on the file example, yeah, so, so part of the reason that um, we, we wanted to, to, to use a system like this was specifically for uh, allowing any deserializer to be used. So that's also right why it's, uh, you know, we are building systems to, to handle all the different types of data we want to export and send out. Um, but because our data requires custom deserializers for a lot of cases that, you know, imaging, imaging these, these high density images uh, needs a custom deserializer, um, just having the file path instead of having like a you know, default load data frame or something like that is, is needed, so. Other questions? Hi. What kind of uh, images, uh, The largest two are uh, CZI, uh, CZI blue and CZI black. Uh, CZI is uh, not Chan Zuckerberg, it is uh, uh, Carl Zeiss imaging. Um, and the other, the other major one is called OME TIFF, which is open microscopy environment, and then TIFF is this, is this format that was invented in like 1970 that's ran by Adobe now. It's, yeah, those two are the main two, and then there's a, you know, a whole plethora of other ones that we sometimes encounter. So. Those are the storage formats that Alan Cell uses, but again, you, Quilt is data agnostic. It's just gonna, if it doesn't understand the data format, it's just gonna copy the bytes, so you can literally put anything in it. So we are, we are also starting to get into uh, potentially putting like the RNA sequence data in there, which is a whole different file format as well. 
Um, but yeah, because you know we generate so much data that we want to share, it's it's nice that we don't have to build a schema specifically for it. If that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Hi. Yeah, so the question is about what is the granularity of change management? It's currently at the file level. We could be more granular at the cost of performance, so this is another thing that we could use input from the community to work on. Um, really common, I think Dropbox hashes four megabyte chunks. We just hash the entire file right now. Yeah. Can I register custom deserializers at runtime in some file? You could. And the way you would do that, so let me go to the as a example here. Did I miss it? Uh, okay, so the way you would do that, by the way, the as a function will take any lambda with the right signature. So even if it's not part of the quilt as a library, you can just load up your own deserializers. And in fact, that's, that's what I'm working on now is providing these custom deserializers as just, you know, import the inks as a library or whatever it is, or Alan Cell Lab as a library. Uh, so, so yes, so partially, uh, you know, the people who are really interested um, in our data currently, like currently available is, is people who know how to open these files. Um, but as I said, uh, with our more predictive model stuff is like, we want to get to a point where like educators can say to a classroom, like, here's a model, go ahead and use it. Um, but that in itself is somewhat finicky, uh, as machine learning people probably know. Um, so we want to provide these deserializers that, that make it easier. Um, in the case of RNA-seq RNA data uh, and, and more complex data types, providing a package that has all of our Allen cell deserializers would be nice that they don't have to install them one by one or something like that. Um, I don't know if, if that answered your question. I guess the question was, let's say you're already storing a file type uh, for six months oh. and you don't have a deserializer. Yes, yet. so the, fi it's, it's, uh, the file and the deserializer are separate objects, right? So the file can live wherever it, where it wants to on, on the quilt servers, but it's, it's, it gets deserialized you know, in runtime. So, so whenever I can push a change to the deserializer, but the file doesn't change, and so it'll still interact properly. So you don't have to specify the, the deserializer no. on file three. So, so the example being, uh, right, there are <laughs> how many imaging, Python imaging, image reading libraries possible, you could have uh, PIL, Py Python Imaging Library is like main one, and then like image is another deserializer, all for JPEG. You could have five different imaging libra libraries as a deserializer for JPEG files. So, yeah. How many people use Pickle out there? Please stop. So, <laughs> we, we, we have bent over backwards. This is actually more really sharing our battle scars with you, like Pickle as much as you want. But Pickle has a couple of vulnerabilities. So the first is if you serialize in Pickle 2, you cannot deserialize, excuse me, if you serialize in Pickle 3, you cannot deserialize that in Pickle 2. And the way to fix that is you actually have to monkey patch Pickle and give it an older version of the Pickle deserializer. It's ugly. The other thing, Pickle is not secure at all. So a lot of the work that we need help from the open source community is to bring this to our dispatch table of like, because there are just so many exotic file formats and we're done trying to come up with one true format. What we do need is for people to contribute to serializers and not only is Pickle not for performant, it's not secure. And so part of the serialization process and deserialization process has to be also recording the version of the serializer that you used. Because version over version, you know, if you serialize with version A and then deserialize with version B, you can have problems. All right, well, thanks for your time. We'll be around. Oh. I was just going to ask about local mirroring if you thought about that or if you have hashes. And if we have a subset of data, can we avoid re downloading it as a, as a group or an institute, or is that not really supported? Got it. So, this is an interesting question. The question is can you federate different quilt sources and deduplicate across buckets or across registries, so to speak? The infrastructure is there to do it. The Quilt client currently assumes that you're only talking to one registry at a time, but because we have content addressable file storage, like we will know if you have those bytes. You just have to use exactly the same hashing algorithm that we use. 
And where we're going for quilt three, which is not live yet, and the SQL stuff I showed is on top of quilt three, where we're going with quilt three is that you'll be able to federate these buckets. Because people don't want to be copying their data and moving it around, even if it's into quilt. They want their data to live where it lives. And your question about torrenting is that is supported. So believe it or not, like amongst the millions of features of S3, you can actually turn torrenting on from S3. Whether or not the difference between S3 performance and CloudFront like CDN performance is actually very small. So I'm not convinced that torrenting from S3 will actually help, but it's certainly within the realm of possibility. I would, I would add also on the other side, so that's the distribution side, but also on the consumption side, uh, there is also, you can point a, your local quilt store to any directory on your drive. So, you know, we have a giant shared like 100 terabyte drive on our network and I just push everything to that drive and that means that anyone in the institute who's connected to that drive can then access the same packages. Yeah, that is. I'll so just, we don't have to have 10 versions or 10, 20 people having the same 200 gigabyte package. It's it's all in one. So. Shared drives. Yeah. All right. Thanks for your time. <laughs>